I've got a question. Rhetorical. Do not answer. In your head, answer out loud. You don't have to say anything. I just want to know how many of you are about ready to give out. <laughs> Anybody running out of steam for the holidays yet? Yeah. Yeah. We do sometimes at moments we can just flat out run out of gas. We got uh, orders from headquarters in Virginia. We've got a birthday party we're trying to do for my granddaughter. And they want stuff. My son called me up with a list. We've got to do this, we've got to do that, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. And I said, yeah, you know, we will really work hard on that because we do not want her, Remy, my one-year-old granddaughter, yelling at us because we didn't get all this done. I mean, she will be devastated if we don't get all of these details taken care of. Remy, you know, she will look around and she'll be like, what? You didn't get the little stir sticks? What? And then, you know, like by the time she's 16, she'll just hate her grandparents because they didn't get all that stuff done. She's one. How many think the problem is not Remy? <laughs> So I was teasing them about it. You know, they're just going, to, this is their first baby. They're just so excited. They need about 10 more is what they need. That'll fix them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be like, we made it in one piece. Well, you know, the, this season can be pretty busy. And, um, and giving, I don't know whether y'all are experiencing some of the same things I am. I, I walk through all these places and there's somebody everywhere ringing a bell or holding out a boot or wanting a hat or passing this or passing that. And you, you even you, the checkouts, you can hardly go through a checkout. Would you like to give to this hospital, that thing, whatever? You just add, round it up, do this, do that, add a dollar. <sighs> Sometimes I feel like I'm about give out. Yeah. Well, there's this story about this woman at the well. And you guys know I like to talk about this because it's one of my favorite stories because I need reminded of this. So you don't need reminded. I'll just remind me today and you all just smile and grin. But uh, you can read it in John chapter 4. And if you want to join me and turn there, I'm going to just read a few of the verses. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's, it's like verses 1 through 34 is the whole story. Um, I just want to read starting with about verse 5 and talk just a little bit about that. Um, so if you catch up with me, I'm using the New King James Version, and it says in that version, so he came to the city, a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So most of us are familiar with this story. And we know that Jesus starts prophesying over her. And telling her everything that happened in her life. And, and she's, had a, she's had a rough life. So it's about noon. And Jesus is already running out of steam. How many, <laughs> don't raise your hands. How many of you get to noon some days and you're like, I'm already running out of steam. It happens. It even happened to Jesus. And so, you know, now, now you got scriptural evidence that you're not, something's not horribly wrong with you if you're starting to run out of steam at noon. And Jesus, he didn't have those energy drinks that he could go get. But he sent the disciples in after them, apparently. No, I'm just kidding. So he sends his disciples in to get lunch, and um, he ends up ministering to this Samaritan woman. And by the time... The disciples get back. Jesus has had some kind of an energy infusion. And the disciples are looking at him and he's going, oh, I'm good. We brought you food. No, I'm good. I'm good. He's energized and ready to go. The thing that happens is sometimes in the midst of us giving out, we make a place for something to be taken in. And Jesus is sitting there and really just having a normal conversation, not anything supernatural about asking for a drink of water. And he asks for this drink of water, and the next thing you know, he's in a supernatural conversation. 
He just begins to give out of what he has, which wasn't a lot because he'd been running out. But he gives that little bit that he's got, and suddenly something starts to flow in because it really is when we give out that God starts to let it flow in. We have to actually repent, change the way we think, to get this in our thinking because it's not a natural process. We don't think of giving as the method through which we can receive unless you're a televangelist. And then they'll tell you to give all day long and it's always about money. That's the last thing I want to talk about today really is money. I want to talk about other things because Jesus didn't give the woman any money. But Jesus did model giving what you've got and then getting something put in you that's an overabundance in its place. And he modeled it right here. In his giving, his own need was met. So can we really give our way out of need? Well, Luke 6, 38 says, Give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It will flow into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. The same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. We'll get to that in a minute, but I want to emphasize that. The context of this verse is not money. Did you know that? That's usually when this verse is preached, when somebody wants some money. The context of this verse is not money. So let me read context for you, starting with verse 32 of chapter 6 of Luke. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. What are we talking about? Love. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Doing good is a manifestation of love. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners and receive as much back. Well, that almost might be money. But I think it's still love. I think the full context of this isn't just money, that's for sure. But love your enemies. There we go again. We're back to love. Do good to and lend, hoping for nothing in return. What? what? Wait, what? Lend, hoping for nothing in return. And think about that. I lend it to them, and I'm just hoping they won't pay me back. <laughs> I'll let you think on that for a while. And your reward will be great if you do that. Your reward will be great, and you'll be the sons of the Most High. Wow. That's pretty cool. How many of you want to, want to be the son of the Most High or daughter? Okay. Good. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. No. What? Kind to the unthankful and evil? What? He's, he's what? Just saying. I don't know. Therefore, be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. <laughs> wow. While I believe that it can apply to money to a degree, I do believe that, you know, sowing and reaping does work in the area of finances. There is a much bigger application. Sometimes we just need to give what we have. When we give what we have, we create a momentum to receive what we don't have. Now, here's going to be a shocking statement to some of you. Are you ready? All right, are you ready? Most of us really don't 
need money. Some of you are looking at me like, yeah, you don't know my budget. Yeah, I do. And you could live on less, and you know you could. But sometimes you don't, because it's too much fun to have stuff. How many like your stuff like me? I like my stuff. I got some stuff. Got stuff. I like my stuff. But when I say that, that's not really what I'm trying to lead to either. Most of us don't really need money. We have other needs that we think money will solve. It's not so much that we need money. We've got these other needs, and we think if I had money, that would get fixed. How many of you are like me? You've thrown money at things that never got fixed. Yeah, I've done that. Yep, yipper, yipper. When we give, though, we open up doors of blessing, and that blessing comes back to us in more abundance than we gave out. It comes back pressed down. It comes back shaken together. It comes back running over, overflowing. And where is that blessing put, according to the scripture that we were reading? You know, he says he's going to pour that blessing into your bosom. Some of you are going to like, what does he mean by that? When, in, when this was written in the day that this was written, people kept all their goodies, their safe stuff, the stuff they didn't want anybody to get. They had a belt, and then they had this area. And some of them, you know, they didn't have big stomachs like we do. <laughs> Actually, some of them did, but, you know, but a lot of them had even bigger stomachs because they hid all their stuff right here. They tied the belt, and then they would stuff it inside, and it would hang in there, and that's where they kept their precious stuff. And when they would give to somebody, they would pull out from this area, from their bosom, and they would give to somebody. And God says, when you do that, he's going to give back more than can fit in your shirt to the point where it's flowing into your lap. Isn't that cool? I want to get more, and that's okay. And it's not bad to get more. More's good. So, I've told this story, but I love it. This prince comes down the road, and there's a pauper sitting by the side of the road, and the pauper's got a bag of rice, and the prince looks at him, he says, could I have some of your rice? And the pauper is indignant, but it's the prince. He doesn't want to refuse him. How dare he ask me for something? He's got everything, and I'm poor. So the pauper reaches into his bag, and he pulls out three grains of rice and gives to the prince. And then the prince reaches into his bag of gold and pulls out three gold coins and gives to the pauper. Now, what's the pauper thinking? I should have given him the whole bag is what I should have done. I said, here, come on, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. Never forget that God has a plan for you, and what he's given you is enough to do what he's called you to do. If you'll do what he's called you to do with what he's given you to do with, he will find that you are the kind of person who he can drop more on. But if he finds that you don't do that, then he just sees you as a moron. That just came out of nowhere, but I liked it anyway. I didn't have that in my notes. You can tell, right? It's like, yeah, you wouldn't write that. You, if you read that, you would be like, no, don't say that. So here's the thing. He wants to pour more blessing on you. And somebody says, well, I wish God would give me more money. I've said it. Me too. I'm, I, yep, I've done it. And the Lord's telling me, stop thinking like that. You've already got enough to do what I've given you to do. Do you believe that? I'm not sure. Well, it's because you think that you need more money to do things, and actually there's already things that you can do that don't take money. Hmm. <laughs> John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We celebrate that this time of year. We celebrate that God gave us his son. That whoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life. Not just in eternity, but life that's flowing through you now. 
that is unquenchable life that flows through you. We have this tendency to think about the great future home in heaven, but heaven's already flowing through you. And all we have to do is just let it flow, baby. Just let it flow. God's a giver. God's looking for opportunities to give. God loves to give. It's God's nature to give. God's nature resides in you. It's your nature to give. Romans 8, 32. Who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall, we, how shall he not also, or shall, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God wants to give you all things. Everybody say all things. All things. That's good. God, God is freely giving you all all things. It's all yours. God's going to give it all to you. That's what he wants. He freely. So what's stopping him? Back to that verse in the context. For with the same measure that you measure with, it will be measured back to you. It's the, I'm hanging on Worried about this and that and the other instead of letting go and letting God. Now, again, I want to make sure I'm saying something here very clear. Stop thinking money. We're going to work on that in just a second here. But the first principle of receiving is giving. Jesus modeled it. That's what we need to understand. But stop thinking money. I don't have anything to give, you say. Well, if you're sitting here today, you've got something to give. You already gave to me. I just feel good to have you here. I feel better just because you're here. It is. It's nice. It's really good to have Dave here today. And his cute little baby girl. Man, she's so cute. You know, and he helped us out today and, and filled in for Mr. Pfeiffer, who's missing. Because he's with Mrs. Pfeiffer. Hey, let me just say something about that. I forgot to, but I'll just stick that right in here in the sermon. John would have loved to have been able to invite everybody to his wedding. But they didn't invite everybody to their wedding. They really would have liked to have invited everybody to their wedding. But they were a little bit worried about the budget. He loves you all. So it was really awkward for him to try to figure out. And he tried to send out invitations. And I think some people didn't get the ones that were sent. And... So if you didn't get invited, I think the only reason I got invited was I was doing the wedding. No, just kidding. <laughs> John's been like a son forever, but you all understand how that works, don't you? Okay, yeah. So just don't give him any grief, except for the Ohio State-Notre Dame game. You can give him grief about that. What's that? We should watch that? Yeah, we should watch it here together. Yeah, you know what happens, though. If Notre Dame wins, I have to wear a Notre Dame <laughs> jersey the following Sunday. Yeah, it ain't going to happen. See, that's a... My daddy told me it's all right to bet on things as long as it's a sure thing, so I'm... I'm... Oh, boy, this could come back to bite me, couldn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, Cord's like hoping it will. All right. First principle of, of receiving is giving, and you always have something to give. Jesus was spent... He was out of gas. He had given out. He sat down. And then he found that he had something to give. And as we give what we have, we make room for him to give what he has. As we give what we have, we make room for him to give what he has. So let's think of some, talk about some low cost to no cost things we can give. Here's one. Smile. Smile. That is just, that's, somebody says, well, that, I don't know. If I get, if I smile, something's liable to break. <laughs> you have to work on it, exercise it. For years, people have uh, said that it takes more muscles to frown than to smile. Um, actually, I was doing some research on that, and it's way out there. There's just arguments all over the place on it, and most of the physiologists now say that it's just kind of 
depends on what you've developed in your life. It's kind of like one per person put it. Uh, I smile a lot. And, and they say even a forced smile is better than no smile. And the other thing is children smile about 400 times a day and adults smile about 20 times a day. So you need to go find a kid and then you ought to study this. It's, I was reading, I don't have time to share it all with you, but you would be amazed at how much smiling. There, there's, it, they say that when you find yourself smiling, it's changing your mental stuff. It's, you know, you're just, it's changing your world. You just need to go find somebody and, 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 and look in the face of some children and get them getting you smiling. And boy, that was awesome this morning. Lydia, I got in her little face and then she went, and she lit up, and then she made a little noise, and she was just happy. She giggled, and I'm like, oh, this is cool. Yeah, isn't it great? Baby giggles are the best. They really are. So, yeah, um, giving a smile doesn't cost you any money. And you can smile at people all day. And I do. I, I intentionally smile at, at people that check out and stuff like that. I love it. The checkout people always say, did you find what you were looking for? And usually in the spring, I like to say, no, you haven't got any leprechaun traps. And the little buggers have been stealing my pot of gold. <laughs> and they look at me like, but they can't help but smile. It's like, I went up to one the other day, and she said, did you find everything you were looking for? I said, you're out of reindeer traps. <laughs> yeah, I'm expecting a few on my roof. I'll make sure that I catch them this year. We need to come up with some of those, just a whole list of them we can just use, you know, and just, and then you got people smiling and, you know, it just makes their day. It just breaks them out of their doldrums. Because some of you know, some of them like, did you find everything you're looking for? Beep, beep, beep. They're not even looking at it. You're like, it's just fun. So, yeah, that, that smiling is contagious. Just Google smiling is contagious if you want to see more on it. it. It is so powerful for you to smile. And it won't cost you anything, and every one of us can do it. A greeting is a great thing that you can give. Matthew 5, 47 says, If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? We're taught as children not to talk to strangers. Hmm. But here's an idea. What if we practice getting to know people here really well? We learn to just get to know people here. We practice it like every time we do the shake hand things, we just, we just really make it an effort to learn to be the kind of person who gets to know people. And if you don't know their name, you know, find ways. Get over your, your fear and find ways of saying, you know, I should, I should know your name. It slipped out of my mind. Can't remember it right now. And then... You get used to asking that and used to not being embarrassed about not know, knowing somebody's name. And then the next thing you know, you'll meet people that you don't know and you won't be afraid to ask their name because you'll be used to asking people their name or saying, remind me, I should know you. I just had it happen at Kroger yesterday. I'm in line and I look up and there's this gal and at first I didn't know her and she goes, aren't you? And I says, Tim Hacker. I just gave it to her. I just helped her. She goes, yeah. And I go, you're... And she told me her name. I've forgotten it now. <laughs> no. Shirley Brown. Shirley, right? Lisa's like, I don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, Lisa Hacker. Yeah, Lisa Hacker. That's who it was. <laughs> I should know you. Haven't I passed in the... Yeah, well, anyway... When we get to know these people, then all of a sudden they aren't strangers. Then we're not talking to strangers. We start talking to people we know. And I know how hard that can be, by the way. I was the guy that came into the church and didn't know anybody. And everybody knew everybody, but I had to know everybody, and I didn't know anybody. And I was trying to get everybody's names and get them figured out. And then on top of that, we went in, and my son was playing football. And all of the parents at the football thing knew each other because their kids had been here for, you know, 11, 12 years together going to school, and we're the new people on the block. And to this day, people will see me, and they'll talk about Josh, and I know I should know your name, and I don't, and it's awkward. 
So I get it. But if we'd practice it here, we'd be much better at doing it out there. Right? That's why, that's why this thing that we do at the end of the worship service is, is highly valuable. It really is. There'd be a lot less strangers in the world. In today's check, test, text, um, Jesus didn't even co- start the conversation with something supernatural. He just started in the natural. You never know what's going to happen if you start in the natural. The next thing you know, you may have an opportunity to do something, and God steps in, and something supernatural flows through you and to another person. Start with a greeting. Come on, you can help me preach this today, right? What else is free that you can do? Time. Time. That's awesome. Give somebody a little bit of your time. Give them an ear. Listen. Some people need somebody to listen. Anybody else got one? What's that? Labor. Yeah, you can help somebody. Man, there might be just somebody that lives a couple doors down and they just don't have what it takes to go out and get their, their leaves raked up and you know they're in a bad place and it's hard for them and, you know, you can help. You can go do something for somebody and it won't cost you anything. See how much we have to give? Well, I couldn't rake somebody's leaves. No, but I bet you you could do something for them. You could bake them cookies and take them down some cookies. Well, that would cost me money. I wanted to, and I didn't get time to this morning because I was working on trying to play that piece right that I didn't play right anyway. But anyway, um, th- there was, there's a video out there that I saw on Facebook the other day, and it's this, it's this boy who is part of this basketball team as their manager, and he's, you know, he's never suited up. And the last game of the year, the coach says, suit up, you're going to play today. And they're ahead at the end, but the coach said, I didn't care whether we are going to win or lose. I didn't care. I was going to put him in at the end and make sure he got a basket. So they put him in, and the other people kind of, you could tell the other team figured it out. They didn't rush the kid. So they try to pass him a couple of passes, and he throws it up, and he keeps missing. And he's running out of time. And he finally gets his last shot at it, and he throws it up, and he misses, and it bounces out of bounds. And the opposing team's got it with seconds left on the clock. And a boy from the opposing team yells his name. He says, hey. And he turns and looks, and the boy throws him an easy bounce pass. And he turns around, and it wasn't the winning shot. The other, you know, his team had out played the other team, but the boy on the other team was aware enough of what was going on. He yelled his name, bounced past it to him, and he says, go, get it. And the young man turns around with seconds being left. He heaves up the ball, and it goes in. And the place comes unglued. I should have got that for you to see. Maybe I'll get it next week. And all these people rush the court, and it's like the coolest thing ever. Because the opposing team even wanted to see him score. That boy on the opposing team, he gave something money would never buy. You never know when what you gave is something that money could never buy. You walk away thinking you didn't do anything. And that little kid at the church Christmas party remembers that into his old age. Because that person cared enough about me to say my name and to give me something. Are we getting this? There are all sorts of things you can do that are relatively inexpensive. Did you know that you can download this sermon, put it onto a CD and take it to somebody? Absolutely free. Well, I have to buy a CD. I'll sell you one for a quarter. They've gotten cheap. You know that, don't you? Like, you can buy CDs. In fact, the problem with that is a lot of people don't have a CD player anymore. It's like, well, I have, I just, everything's an MP3. I, well, help somebody to figure out how to go to our website and click. Most of you can do it on your phone. There's all sorts of ways to, 
to help people have some kind of a neat experience. This would be a, a free one. How about thanks? I always try to thank people when they open a door for me or do something nice for me. But I found that it's even a better opportunity if you can remember and think about it and not be in such a hurry to get in there and get the thing you came to buy if you can actually stop and look at them and look them in the eye and say, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It, you know, you just made somebody's day. You talk about making somebody smile. We can also give thanks to God. Thank God for what people did for us. You know, you can tell a thankful person because they're full. That's, that's how you know they're thankful. Wait a minute. I haven't done this in a while. Is there, is there a bottle here close? There's one right there. Give me that bottle. I hope I got enough in here to do this. Yeah, I got enough. This is just great. I've seen this illustration done by somebody else. And I just love this. And I've done it before. Some of you will remember it, and some of you will be like, I don't remember him doing that before. Okay, there's a bottle. Is that full? No. So let's just, let's just fill it up. Let's just get it full. Is it full now? Not quite. Is it full now? You know how you know for sure when it's full? You know how you know for sure when it's full? You can really be sure it's full when it does this right here, right, right there. Got it. I think it's full now. You know, yeah, I got to take those home now, both of them, because I've gummed, gummed them. <laughs> My hand's all wet now. But here's the thing. <laughs> you know it's full and completely full when it's overflowing. Be thankful, and pretty soon everybody will know it because they'll see you overflowing. So if you're not giving a lot of thanks, you're probably not thankful yet. You find yourself giving thanks a lot, that's because you're thankful. You have to give it. You can't hold it anymore. If you can hold it, you're not thankful. Yeah. And of course, on top of all this, his presence is key to everything. Because... We enter his presence with thanksgiving. Psalm 95, 2. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us. How do we know what's freely given to us? By the spirit. How do we know what's freely given to us? By the Spirit. The Spirit. Do we know what's freely given us by the Word? Not without the Spirit. There are a lot of people who read the Word. Harold and I were talking about this this week. Atheists read the Word, trying to pick it apart angry, trying to prove that it's not true. They don't read by the Spirit, so they don't get it. They don't get it. It doesn't register. We can read through the Bible and see the promises, but what we really need is for God to quicken those promises to us by the Spirit. And when the promises of the Word are quickened to our spirit, they become alive, and then something starts to happen. This is yes. Yeah, it's good. So we need to know what's freely given to us, and that comes from us being people of the presence. 
His presence is a big deal. Matthew 10, 8 says, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. I, well, I can't do all that. Well, make room. He wants to put it in you. Make room. He wants to fill you with that. You can't give what you haven't got, that's for sure. And you can only give what you've received. So what do you have to give? Well, start giving what you've got and make room for God to give you more that you don't have. I just start where I am. I just give what I've got. I don't have to figure out how am I going to raise somebody from the dead. I just need to stop being dead and start giving people what I've got. Start where I am and not worry about where I'm going as much as whose I am and where he's going. So the more time I give to him and the more thanks we give to him, the more of his presence that we'll experience. The more of his presence that we experience, the more we'll have to give. So when I start to find myself giving out, I realize that what I really need to do is give out. If I'm giving out, that might not be a bad thing. Just give out a little bit more. Make sure there's plenty of room for what he wants to put in. He can do it. He's hungry to do it. He loves to give. God's not withholding anything. And we, when we start growing in our generosity, our hearts become more like his, and he's able to release more through us. So, there isn't a better time of year than right now to start giving what you've got. And I'll remind you of one more thing. Merry Christmas. Some of you remember me talking about this, but I try to remind us every year. Mary, joyful, overflowing, Christ, anointed one, mass sent forth. The joyful, overflowing of the anointed one sent forth. I can release it on people. And they don't even know. Merry Christmas. What an awesome thing for us to do. I could have waited until next week, but I want to give you extra time to get extra opportunities to smile at somebody like you know something they don't know and go, Merry Christmas. And in the back of your head, you're thinking, sick him, Jesus. Come on, touch him, Lord. And by the way, I've been doing this. Some people will stop me and say, thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying Merry Christmas, not just Happy Holidays. I've already had that happen, I think, twice in just the last week. Thank you for saying that. I was doing it when I was ringing the bell at the mall, too. Ding, ding, ding. Merry Christmas. And I had a couple people say, thank you for saying that. And then they, oh, they were thankful, which drew them into the presence <laughs> this is so much fun. And it's easy. Try it at home. You know, they always say, don't try this at home. Try this at home. Try it at the mall. Try it everywhere you go. And the more you do it, the more natural it becomes. And the more natural it becomes, the more supernatural it becomes. And the more supernatural it becomes, the more likely it is that God is going to do something you never thought he could do through you. So I want you to stand up now. <clears throat> Get where you can look, look at somebody in the eye. Now tell them, just look at them and say, <laughs> look at them and say this, you are full of it. <laughs> <laughs> You, yeah, see, they are. They're full of good things that they can share. What do you think I meant? Come on. <laughs> All right, put your hands out in front of you like you're ready to receive something here. We're going to pray.
Ah, God is good. <laughs> Father, thank you. We receive from you understanding that we already have everything you want us to have to do what you want us to do. And that as you give us more to do, you will supply more to do it with. So we thank you, God, that all we have to do is do what we have to do with, do the things that we can do, and you will continue to flow through us to the place, God, where we will see the lame walk and the blind eyes open and the dead raised. And we have seen it, and we thank you for it being present here today, Lord, evidence of it. So we know, God, that you are doing good things through every one of us. None of us is disqualified. None of us is able on our own, but we are enabled by the presence of your spirit. So we thank you and praise you for it, and we will go forth doing what you've given us to do with what you've given us to do. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Amen.